Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, just your love. Uh, thank you for the chance to gather with my brothers and sisters. Uh, we do thank you for the snow. Um, uh, life stuff it has challenges with it, but we uh, just so appreciate the moisture and uh, the beauty. And Lord, uh, just thank you that we have a place where we can come and uh, gather and be comfortable and just join together with worship and study over your word. Lord, help us to really... Um, just enjoy and appreciate the blessings that you pour out on our lives, including these things. So thank you, Lord, and we pray as we open our word, your word now that uh, you just speak to our hearts, Lord. Show us uh, your, your love, truth, and wisdom. Uh, help us to have hearts that are hungry to hear from you, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you haven't turned to Ecclesiastes 10, I would encourage you to do that. Um, we're living in a pretty modern digital world, you know, and maybe not all of us are quite up to speed on that, but uh, you probably are f much further along than you ever imagined you would be. I can remember back being uh, a few years ago where uh, people didn't even have computers. They didn't know what they were. And it's like you're carrying around a computer uh, uh, that connects you with the entire world in your pocket. And uh, we, we get a lot more exposure, you know. I mean, I realize some of us are like, hey, you know, I'm a little intimidated by this stuff. Uh, none of us are as skilled as some of the younger generation the digital they're called digital natives they grew up with those things you know you two-year-olds that can use your smartphone and stuff you're going <laughs> i can't even use it they can figure it out but uh you know that's uh that's just the times in which we're living and there's a lot of things that come with that are conveniences and one of those is apps you know you've heard the joke that there's an app for that uh just about anything you want to do there's a, some sort of an app for it and for those of you guys that are not digital natives the App means it's short for application. Maybe you didn't know that. And that's, that's kind of an important insight. That, that what this thing that we're talking about, apps, is, is intended to be applied to something. And uh, uh, you know, lots of different ways that we can use it. I mean, I was watching some of the reports this, this you know, New Year's. You know, uh, they have all kinds of new things w that work with your phone, with your watch, your smart watches. Uh, the, the, you know, they'll tell you when to drink water because you might be dehydrated, and so they have a little, oh, you need to drink water, you know. They have some that'll monitor your heartbeat and say, you're getting kind of stressed. You need to take some deep breaths, you know. I mean, it's like, it's crazy stuff, you know. That, uh, but it, what an app is basically is software. It's, it's computer programming that allows you to perform specific tasks. They're kind of narrow focus in some ways, uh, and it, they, they have something that usually is to be downloaded onto your phone, like we have an app for the church, right? So that, that's... Uh, an application for a specific purpose to connect you with our fellowship and information, and, and you have to download it to, um, generally speaking, a mobile device. You can certainly do desktops too, but generally speaking, you know, phone or tablet or something like that. Keep in mind, you know, this idea of a download and um, specific purposes and to something that's mobile, All right? So uh, there are apps for almost anything that you can imagine and probably some things that you can't imagine. Uh, I mean, you... you Go to your app store and you can find that out. Uh, the question would be, if we're on the subject, would you be interested in, in an app that would provide you with wisdom? I mean, just a little app, you know, just, oh, this would be cool. I just get, because the wi wisdom, what the word wisdom really, the, the practical definition of it is, means to give you skill for living. I mean, to, to live and make skillful, you know, good decisions and the contrast is to not be wise or not to have wisdom, and that means to be a fool. And the Bible has a lot to say about it. Seventy-one times in the book of Proverbs, the word fool is mentioned and identified as like, this is foolish behavior, this is what a fool says and a fool does. And most of us would go, I, you know, I, I've been foolish way too often in my life, but I don't want to continue to be foolish. So I, I need wisdom, right? So it'd be cool if there was an app for that. Well, there's something that's actually better than an app. And it's, I know it's a little bit of a weird tack on this thing, but, uh, you know, our, part of our idea of taking Ecclesiastes is to show how it applies, uh, how we bring application to our lives. And so we want it to be something that we apply, something that has direct impact on our lives. We want to get insights from this book, right? And there's something better than an app. It's not a, it's not a impersonal thing. It's, it's the Word of God. But it's like an app in the sense that it has to be downloaded to you. It doesn't do any good if it's just out there and say, well, a lot of other people get benefit from it. Well, it has to be downloaded to us. And that comes by us absorbing it, by reading, thinking about it, 
praying about it and allowing God to give us insight and take it to our hearts as well as our minds. I mean, that's one of the things we talk about, right? And, uh, we're supposed to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. So it, it's not just that we put it in our heads. It has to translate or connect or be applied to our hearts. It's something that we have to grab a hold of. That's the download, and you're the mobile device because, see, it, it affects, it, it's you going and applying these, the wisdom of God's word to your, to your life. And the, the advantage we have uh, is not only word, it's not just information being downloaded to us, but it, it's the Holy Spirit. It lives in us. And for every believer, it's, he takes God's word and gives us insights and gives us understanding and shows us how it connects with our life. And so it's, it's the idea of God saying, I really want to give you wisdom. And I, I have my word for you, and my truth, my light, my understanding, but I also want to give it to you and, and allow my Holy Spirit who lives in you to show you the connection, show you how to apply this, right? It's a living relationship. Uh, you know, we've drawn some, some illustration or some uh, connection or parallels of the idea of an application, except this is not just, you know, it's not a digital thing. It's, it's life. It's living. It's a relationship that, with God, right? And it's, it's not a simulation. And that's something that it's so weird in our culture that we, we are willing to settle for sim life simulations of life things that are not really alive but they make us think and feel and kind of treat them as if they are i mean you got people you know uh hello alexa hello siri you know they're talking to their computers you know and they're they all would you do this and would you do that and, and they think they're talking to a person it's like no it's software it's not alive but you know they 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 do it so comfortably and it's you know it's designed to make you kind of have those feelings but sometimes we, we, we miss the fact that's, that's a simulation. There's no life in it whatsoever. But we begin to think that it is. What, what, this, what God wants is requires a personal rela relationship. He doesn't want it to be an a unliving, you know, cyber reality, you know, uh, imaginary thing. It's like, no, 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 no. This is a real relationship with a living being who is the creator. And he sent his son to be the connection, the bridge, the the mediator to bring us into relationship with him and, and it comes through jesus christ and through him alone we have to have a relationship with him the, the bible tells us very plainly in first john it's like uh, if you have the son you have the father also if you don't have the son you, you don't have the father so there's no uh circumventing him or going around him we we i mean it, it makes sense right for us obviously in this room most of us i, I think i know everybody here um we we came to know we were sinners. And we understood the gospel, the good news that God sent his son to save us from our sins. And then we come to believe and receive him. We receive Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with him. But we get one not only with him, but also with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Because it's a relationship with the living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we, it's a little challenging for us sometimes when we, even when we think about it and we pray, we go, you know, Father and Son and Spirit, and who do I pray to? And it's like, well, you pray to God. And sometimes you, you have more attention to the, the Father, and sometimes you're more, but you can't avoid the Son. You can't, I mean, how can you say, well, I just love the Father. Jesus, I, I don't know too much. What? That's how you come to know God, is through what Jesus did for you. And so it requires that personal relationship with him. Now, there are plenty of people who simulate a relationship with God. They talk about God, and we, we know that there's examples in the Bible where there are people who in the last day, the judgment day, are going to stand before God and say, God, I did all kinds of stuff for you. And he's going, I never knew you. So those people had a, a deception about their connectedness with God. They thought they had something because they were religious and they believed in God in a mental way. You say, but you never had a personal relationship. And that's, that's a critical part of what we're looking at in the Bible. It's not just giving us information that we need to apply. It's information that leads to relationship. And that's the application. And from that, God has the, the opportunity to speak to our lives and direct us and give us that wisdom for day-to-day -day stuff. Um, this book that we're looking at is Solomon's attempt to examine life. And so today we're going to look at a portion of this and um, this is what Solomon said beginning of the book in chapter 2 uh, he said I decided to consider wisdom as well as foolish behavior and foolish ideas 
And so we see those things set kind of in contrast to one another throughout the book. And from time to time you go, oh yeah, that's stupid. That's foolish stuff. And other times you go, oh yeah, that, that, uh, that's, that's wisdom that I probably could apply. Because I've done the opposite before and it didn't work out very well. So now I want to do what's wise. And that's what Solomon's looking at. He's just examining life, right? And so and we, this is a little bit of a backtrack for you guys that were here last week. Um, verse 1, uh, he says, you need to understand that even a little bit of foolishness can, can change the, uh, the testimony of your life from something that is appealing and pleasant and honorable to something that is, yeah, it's just kind of smells. And he says, it, even just a little bit, you know, so a little folly will have that kind of impact on somebody who is respected. So the idea right from the get-go is like, hey, don't treat this as if it's not important. Because a little dumb, you know, a few dumb choices can make a big difference in your life. Foolishness is as defined as uh, ideas. We, we see this in the psalm. It says, uh, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. But it's describing a, a kind of senselessness, a cluelessness. I mean, obviously, you'd have to be pretty clueless to think that there's no God, right? Because we have a testimony in creation that God s says that it goes through every language. It's, it's in, the, in everything that is made is a testimony of a creator. Romans chapter 1 says that the, the, even the things that are knowable about God are made evident to people by God. And so you go, how clueless would you have to be? You, you miss the testimony of creation. You miss the testimony of God himself speaking to you that he exists. And you've, you miss the testimony of your own conscience in Romans 2. He goes, that, that's a pretty senseless person. And he says, that's, that's the fool that says, there's, there's no God. He doesn't say, I don't know who God is. That's a different thing. That's a, we'd call that an agnostic. And he says, no, not that. But when somebody says, I know there's no God. Really? You know everything? No, you don't. Right? So that's a foolish thing. And it frees people to live in a foolish way because they're clueless or senseless about the decisions they make, about right and wrong, about good and evil, and they just do whatever they want. And many times the connection is that they're proud. They're, they're people who are unwilling to be instructed. I don't know if you run into people like that. Oh, yeah, you do. We run into them all the time. They know everything about everything, right? And you can't talk to them. It's not like you think you're so much smarter, but there are times when you go, clearly, you're wrong. But they don't want to listen, and they won't be instructed. They won't even learn from their mistakes. Sometimes that's what we hope for when we see some people we love. You know, they're going down a road that's destructive, and you go, well, they'll, they'll figure it out. When they hit bottom, they'll figure it out. It's like, no, no. If they're fools, they don't want to learn. They're not willing to learn. They're not going to accept any insight or correction because they know everything. And he says, well, that's, that's a fool. Proverbs 18 says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding. He, he doesn't want to learn because he thinks he knows it all. He only takes pleasure in expressing his opinion. Anybody sound familiar? Don't, don't say anybody's name, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, you know, it's like they don't, it's like having, you, you know, when you have those one-way conversations where you go, I can't get a word in. All he wants to do is just talk. And, and, and he's way off, but he won't listen. And, you know, and you just go, wow, what is that? that that's, biblically, that's a fool. And it's the idea of living as if nothing matters except what I want. And so I do whatever I want. I pursue what pleases me. And it can be drugs or alcohol or immorality or greed or whatever. And you step over people and you go, that's, that's biblically what a fool is. And so he says, we don't want to live that way. We, we don't want to live that way. That's, that's why Solomon's writing these things. So no, we don't have to live that way. And he's encouraging us not to live that way. He says a, right man, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. We talked about this. It means the, you have the a wisdom makes you want to do what's right. And if you, you're a fool, you just want to continue to do what's wrong no matter what it does to other people. I mean, you guys in this room, we, we've, we've all been down that road. Sometimes family members, some of ourselves, who are we... We did the drugs and alcohol thing. We did this kind of deal. We, we, we hurt people along the way, but it was because we really wanted to do that. We went down that road, and you go, I was living like a fool. That's exactly what he's describing. And he says, even a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he shows, he shows everybody that he's a fool. It's such a weird thing to realize that the only person that doesn't know you're a fool when you're a fool is you. 
Everybody else, it's really clear, right? But, but how often we were in that place where we go, I think I'm really cool. Uh, almost cool. You just got to change that first letter to an F. Instead of cool, you're really a fool, all right? And wisdom is defined for us in, in Scripture in simple ways, a couple simple ways. There's some good, good you know, we could get a lot, a lot of volume here. But, you know, fear of the Lord it's a, the idea of caring about God and what he wants more than anything else. I, I fear him. That means a reverence and a respect and a desire to please him above everyone else. So that's, that's the beginning of knowledge. That's the beginning of wisdom. A fool despises wisdom. Not interested in it. Despises instruction. A wise man fears and departs from evil. That's the response to wanting to please God. You go, God says this is the right way. I'm going to do that. This is the wrong way. I'm going to turn away from that. But a fool rages and is self-confident. And boy, do we see that in our culture. I, I'm, I'm doing whatever I want to do, and you can't tell me, and it's the right thing, and I have the right to, I mean, just like this crazy, raging intensity and confidence. And you go, that's indications of foolish lives, foolish choices. All right? And so uh, reverence or wisdom is defined as reverence for God and a sincere desire to do what he commands. That, that's that's going to trans transform a person's life, right? So verse 4, the Spirit, here's, here's some wisdom that is like, this is so contrary to what we would do naturally. And that's why one of the ways you go, yeah, this is this definitely got to be God because I wouldn't do this, right? If the spirit of a ruler rises against you, okay? Think of it in terms of a boss, you know, because you don't have any kings over you. But think of it a ruler, uh, somebody who has authority over your life, a boss or maybe a government official, and they get ticked off at you. They're angry at you. Okay? Uh, what is our normal response? Boss comes in, chews you out. What's your normal response? It's like, you can't talk to me like that. You don't know who I am. I don't have to put up with this. <laughs> you know, all that, all that. Do you guys respond that way? I, I'm, I'm, I hope so. I, don't, I hate to think I'm the only one. And it's like, you know, it's like this stuff comes up inside of us. It's like, who the heck do you think you are? You're, yeah, you're okay, so what if you're a king? I don't care. You can't talk to me that way. You don't know who I am. You know, we have that kind of response that we want to, we want to, like, tell them, you, well, you can take your job and, you know, <laughs> do something with it, you know, <laughs> right? We, we think that kind of stuff, right? That's our response. And, you know, if you don't have any self-control, then you probably lost a few jobs that way because sometimes bosses, you know, they have a bad attitude or something goes wrong and they take it out on you, right? And this is wisdom. Don't leave your post. What? That's not right, God. No, he's going, what? You, is this really about your ego? Your ego's insulted and so you're going to throw away your job? You're going to abandon your responsibility? You're going to give up this post, this position? This clearly implies that they were put in the position by the ruler. Right, so you go, okay, well, we don't have exactly the same situation, but we can certainly relate to it. He says, conciliation pacifies great offenses. Uh, okay, they really offended you, or you maybe you really offended them. Maybe you blew, the, blew it. You really didn't do the job properly. That happens sometimes. You know? and, he, and he goes, well, don't, don't, don't just pack up and leave. Instead, cons be conciliatory. C provide some... You know, um, the word conciliation means to really cure the situation or provide some medicine to the situation. Uh, placidity or yielding, it's like soft response instead of a self-defensive one. It's, it's like quiet answer, a soft answer. Proverbs 15 says a soft answer turns aside wrath. A harsh one stirs it up. So you can make this a big old blow up or you can go, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I'll try to do better next time. You go inside your head. You go, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't I forget all that stuff. Conciliation. And he says, oh, pass. And you can, you can stay in the position. You can stay in your job. You can stay there. Or you can just have an ego and go, oh, you can't talk to me that way. I'm quitting my job. Who's, who loses in that? <laughs> me. Okay. Uh, you can't talk to me that way. I'm going to cut off my income. <laughs> right? Uh, Okay, that's really brilliant, right? So he's just saying, you know, conciliation, it can, you can pacify this whole situation. And then he goes on in verse 5, and he says, uh, 
I guess this is a reality check for us. It's, uh, sometimes it's a little challenging to think what his thought process is. I understand it. But he, he says, there's an evil that I've seen under the sun, it, it, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a lowly place. That's contrary to what you would think. Somebody who is a fool shouldn't be in getting a position of honor or dignity. But, you know, sometimes that's the way the world is, the life is. Sometimes wisdom is not appreciated and, and it's not recognized. And, and it's like, well, gosh, it, that means the world's not perfect. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not news to any of us, right? And so he's going, you know, sometimes it happens. It's, I've seen it. You know, I've seen it where sometimes people who are really <laughs> dumb, really, I mean, we, we, can, we can certainly understand that in our culture, right? Our, 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 our country, sometimes the people that are politicians that are in positions of authority go, Ah, how'd this guy get elected? I, I don't know. Maybe he's a good campaigner or something, but somehow they're they're put in dignity. You know, the guys that are appointed by people in power. You know, and meanwhile, people who have managed their money, been good stewards, developed you know wealth, they're 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 diminished. And you know, certainly in our culture now, it seems like if you have a certain set of values, you're you're regard, disregarded no matter what your cre credentials are. All right, so. Solomon says, I've seen that. So don't be surprised if you find stuff that's not always the way you would expect it. I've seen servants on horses and princes walking on the ground like servants. Totally upside down, weird background where these guys are in charge and they sh they, they, they are, they're the kind of people that need to be ordered around and then the other people who are really capable leaders are not recognized. And you go, well, that's, just, that's just the weirdness of our world. Verses 8 and 9, he, he goes on and talks about wisdom, and, and it's a little challenging stuff, but he says, um, he who digs a pit will fall into it. Now, to get some understanding, you've got to go and compare some other scriptures, look up some other cross-references, and realize that the idea of digging a pit is connected with the idea of trying to entrap people, trying to, you know, kind of lay a snare, trying to trip somebody up. It's, it's connected with being dishonest and evil, and malicious, and he goes, uh, people who do that, if you go down that road, if you think, oh, I, I can get this, and I can take advantage of this guy, and I can rip this guy off or do something to hurt somebody else, he goes, you, you're going you're gonna to fall into it. In other words, you can't do this kind of thing and not pay for it yourself, too. And that's, that's intended to give us the wisdom to not look at it as a, oh, this is an easy road, or I can do this and get away with it. And he goes, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Wisdom will tell you, don't do that. Wisdom will tell you, whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Now, it's weird. You go, well, why would you be breaking through a wall? Well, obviously, you don't have access to that place, so you're trying to get into it. It implies, again, the sneakiness, the deceptiveness, the dishonesty, the you know, criminal behavior, uh, trying to rip somebody off. And he goes, so, okay, well, if you do that, i uh, just going to tell you there's a snake on the other side of that wall. And what he's saying is that you can't do this kind of thing and not be hurt by it, right? And, and see, wisdom, when we hear from God, God says, oh, no, evil has a reward to it. There's a penalty, I guess you'd say. There's consequences for it. And God's telling us, you can't go down that road and not be bitten, right? And so wisdom listens to that. A fool says, well, I can outsmart. I can do it better. I, no, I, they'll never catch me. It's like, oh. Okay, well, that's foolish. God's telling us, oh, you can't do this and not pay for it. Then he says something that I think is not, doesn't seem to imply any evil response, but it's really more uh, kind of just wisdom that's necessary for work. And I know we've got a bunch of guys here that work. And it's like, yeah, if you quarry stones, you may be hurt by them. So what does that tell you? I need some wisdom because, you know, if I do something stupid here, I could get hurt. Right? I mean, we, we all know that. Guys that have worked in construction, you go, uh, there's times you've seen guys do something to, that ain't very smart. You need to, you know, do that a little different because that rock's going to fall down on you if you keep going that way. And he's saying we need wisdom because even in normal work stuff, there are times when you can get hurt by that. You know, if you're splitting wood, you can be endangered by it. Uh, uh, any guys ever split wood? Okay. You ever, you, ever, you ever done something that after you took the swing with the hatchet or the swing with the sleds that you went, oh, I'm so lucky that didn't. All right? You got a big old sledgehammer, you know, axe, and you're, you're swinging like this. 
You know, and you go, oh, oh, that's how those people lose their toes. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? But wisdom tells you, no, no, you don't swing at yourself. You know, you swing straight down at the ground, right? But that takes wisdom. Sometimes you have to get that wisdom the hard way. But sometimes it's just like, God, would you give me some wisdom so I can not get hurt by this? Because it's possible. And I'm not necessarily doing anything evil. I'm just, it's just not wise, right? So he says wisdom uh, can bring success to us. Because when we apply wisdom to lots of practical stuff, it makes a difference on the outcome. He gives an illustration. If the axe is dull and you don't sharpen the edge, then you've got to work harder. And, but wisdom brings success. I don't know. I, I don't really chop a whole bunch of wood with my axe, but I've done it with chainsaws before. I don't know about you guys. I'm sure most of you guys have used a chainsaw, right? And how much fun is it when it's dull? You know, and you're going, I just... I just want to do like another half of a chord. It's just, you know, would you just, I'll just, I'll just live with this dull chainsaw, right? And you're sitting there going, because you just don't want to stop to, to, to take the time to file it and just sharpen it. But then you go, oh, this is way too much work. So you go and you file it and then zing, 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 zing. And he's going, yeah, wisdom tells us like, huh, you know, you're going to kill yourself and not get done. Or you could take a few minutes, sharpen the chain, and it'll go a lot faster. And he says, it brings success. And we, that goes to practical stuff in our lives, our homes, our houses, our businesses. Wisdom brings success, right? And so uh, obviously importing, emphasizing the importance of wisdom. And then verses 11 and 12, he says, uh, he talks about foolish people. And it gives us, I guess, I, I take it as insights that will help us go, you know what? Uh, I'm not judgmental about people, but there's some people you go, I don't really want to be connected with them. I don't, because they, they live foolishly. And the Bible says the companion of fools will suffer harm. So if I hang around with them, it doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I'm not saying be picky and don't, you know, don't have friends, you know, that are unsaved, but it's like, no, this, these are warnings because there are consequences for their decisions, and if you're connected with them, you're going to suffer for those things. You're going to be affected by them. And it's certainly important for us with our teenage sons and daughters because sometimes the, the fools are the guys with the big personalities and, you know, blah, 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 you know that kind of stuff. And, and it's like, yeah, but uh, like he says here, a serpent may bite when it's not charmed. Uh, you know, that's not really in our culture, the snake charming thing. But uh, apparently, you can really charm a snake, and if you don't, he might actually bite you. That makes sense to me. But he says the babbler, guy that's always talking, running off his mouth, talking about his own stuff, always talking, always got to talk, says they're no different. They, they can bite you. They can affect you. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. That's, that's wisdom. Go, ah. You know, I mean, that's even what Paul said in the New Testament. Let our words be seasoned with grace. I mean, we live in a world where there's so little grace. To, to let our words be gracious to people doesn't mean that we condone sin. It means that we extend to them the grace that we've also received. And we understand what that is, and we know how desperately people need it. And he says, a wise man has gracious words. The lips of a fool... Well, they'll, they'll actually swallow him up. In other words, he'll talk so much he'll get himself in trouble and devour himself, right? And so verses 13 and 14, um, the words of his mouth begin with foolishness. At the end of his talk is raving madness. Does that sound like somebody who's going to learn from their mistakes? It's like, no. Th 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 you know, we, we don't want to say there's no hope for this person or whatever, but it's like it's not our job to fix them especially if they won't listen. And you go, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you, bro, because um, you're heading down a really bad path. And if you don't turn, it's not going to be good. And sometimes the things that they say, are, you know, we say madness. They, they say stuff that we, we would, you know, in our comfortable colloquial expression, you go, that's crazy what they're saying. Well, that's what he's describing. It's like, no, it's not a connection with reality. It's just their imaginary thinking I'm going to do this, and I'm going to run the country. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, okay, <laughs> whatever, you're crazy. <laughs> and the fool multiplies his words. No man can know what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? 
Isn't it all, oftentimes the, the conversation is like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make this happen and I'm going to, and this, and he's going, you, you, don't, you don't understand. You don't control the future. I mean, you're talking as if you actually are large and in charge and it's like, no, the truth is you, you're just like the rest of you. You don't know what's coming tomorrow. You know, if you're going to, you know, slip and fall in the parking lot like I did earlier. Okay, I, it didn't hurt me, but, you know, it could have, you know. I mean, it happens. Things you go, I wasn't planning on that. I, I, I got my hiking boots on and everything. I still crash and burn, you know. It's like, okay, so there's stuff that happens. You go, no, we're all subject to not knowing what's coming. And so to, to talk any different is really foolish. Um, one of the things as a characteristic he lays out is the, the labor of fools wearies them. And unfortunately, that's, that's a huge characteristic of our youth. They, they don't know how to work. You know, they'll start a job and it's like, oh, this is boring. It's like, it's called work for a reason. You know, it's not play. It's not fun. It's called work. And they don't understand that sometimes work requires you to actually kind of endure and, and have a little um, intestinal fortitude. You have to stick to it. You have to press through. It, it, but that builds character. It requires character. And, and a lot of them say, well, this is, this is so boring. I've been doing this for five minutes. And you go, uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I don't know how this is going to work out for you. Because you're, you're, you're tired after five minutes. You know, you're, you're weary. And he says, that's, that's what fools are like. They just, they can't work because they, they don't have any stick to it this. Um, they, they, don't even, they don't even know how to go to the city, which is kind of like the most obvious basic thing. Can you find your way home? And then it's like, well, which way is it? <laughs> okay. And he's just laying out some examples here for us to kind of go, okay, yeah, we can, we can relate to that. Then he says, he turns kind of a, the thought to, you know how, how bad this is on a personal level, but think about it when it's leaders. Uh, he says, woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. Now, he's not saying just a little kid, but a, a, a childlike king, uh, an immature, self-centered, you know, self-willed. You know, uh, he says, oh, it's so, so painful. It's, so, it's a woe. It's a negative experience. And he says, and your princes, when they, you know, these are upper level leaders in the government when they feast in the morning. And they, they get up and their primary concern is just to have, you know, uh, really good food, uh, drinks, parties, celebrations. You know, it's all about, you know, enjoying the high life. And he says, they're, they're supposed to. We, we, we know the principle. We understand the basic idea. In our country, we have an advantage, really, that we started out with the idea that people who were in government were public servants. That was, the, you know, we use that terminology pretty freely for a long time, but it's really kind of drifted from that, right? And so he's saying, you know, th this is not the way it's intended to be. It's intended to be leaders are supposed to, they have the responsibility from God to, to serve the people and to provide leadership, not to provide for themselves. And he says, blessed are you when you're, O land, when your king is the son of nobles, meaning someone who has been raised by people who have a noble character, the, the people that had honesty and integrity and they passed it on to their children and trained them and discipled them in, in the, th the good things, godly things. He says, oh, that's, that's such a blessing to a nation when you have people like that. And obviously, uh, we have lots of difficulty with our culture because uh, the stuff that you see in the press uh, sometimes doesn't have any connection with reality and so it's hard for us to know who's who and what are they really like and how do we know? And so it's pretty challenging stuff, but God knows. God knows what's, what's real. The princes, uh, blessed are you when princes feast at the proper time. There are certainly times when it's very appropriate. And they feast for strength, not for drunkenness. Uh, just, just to be totally transparent with you guys, okay? I, I cannot figure out why when they do things at the White House or any kind of, you know, they have alcohol there. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Really, you've got a bunch of world leaders that are all concerned about what everybody knows about them, and you're going you're gonna to get pass out alcohol. It's like, uh, uh, crazy. 
You know, how many times do we hear, well, this guy said this at this party over here because they were, you know, it's like, yeah, that's, that should not be the purpose of, you know, some sort of a government celebration. Let's get everybody together and get drunk. It's like, no, we should, we should get together. And if we need to gather and celebrate, let's celebrate so that we can be strengthened. Let's celebrate and feast so that we have strength to do our job. That, that's what he's talking about here. And uh, Solomon had pretty good experience, I mean, pretty wide experience with the whole idea of celebrations and feasting and that stuff. Verse 18, he says, Because of late laziness, a building decays. And through idleness of hands, the house leaks. If, you, if you've made the transition from being a renter to being a, uh, an owner, a homeowner, you understand exactly what this is about. When you're a renter, you live in the house and you don't take care of it. You, know, you don't have to take care of it. That's his job, right? But when you own the house, it's like, well, who, who's going to fix the roof? <laughs> you? Yeah. Well, who's going to fix the plumbing? You? Yeah. Who's going who's gonna to fix this? Who's going to paint the outside? Who's going to? Who, yeah, you. All right? And there's times, I, you know, like the rest of us, you go, I don't really feel like doing that, you know? Yeah, but that's, you know, because laziness, you know, then the building starts to decay, right? You see some, pl some places like this, and y you can see these things all around our country. I mean, these are, you know, at one time a majestic home, and it's like nobody just, nobody took, cared enough to even take care of it, you know? And you go, and, you know, now at some point you go, eh, it probably needs to be bulldozed, you know, because it's decayed so badly. And, and obviously we're talking about, he's been talking about a nation, and then he talks about a house, and it's like there's, there's a connection there. Obviously, the illustration is a very personal one, you know, small, close to home kind of deal. Talking about a house, but he, he says, yeah, that, that's true for a nation, too. When leaders get lazy and they don't care about what maintains a nation, uh, it decays. And then he says in verse 19 something that you go, who would say this? Well, what has he been talking about? He's been talking about leaders, right? kings and rulers and he goes a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry but money answers everything who says that kind of stuff foolish leaders foolish people that say yeah we're, we're, it's all about partying it's all about having fun it's all about you know getting whatever we want however we want with money and he says that's that's that's, that's really foolish don't curse the king remember you 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 his anger rose against you. It doesn't sound like it was necessarily earned. And so, you know, your temptation is to want to get mad at him. Or maybe you won't get mad at him because you don't want to lose your job. But then you're going to go and say stuff about him. And he says, don't curse the king. Not even in your thought. Oh, that's challenging. Right? Because I don't know about you guys, but my brain's tough to control sometimes. So, no, not even, don't even let your brain go there, your mind go there, not even in your thought. Don't curse the rich, even in your bedroom. The birds of the air might carry your voice, and a bird of, in flight might tell the matter. Uh, yeah, it's, it's almost like we say that, you know, the walls have ears. You know, you say something, and it's, and it's like, how'd they, how'd they hear that? So, well, you said it, you know, and somebody actually heard it, and it, and it gets passed back to them, and next thing you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you're in trouble, right? I think these things are laid out for us because Solomon, who authored the book of Proverbs, uh, knows this truth. He's trying to help us. He's trying to give us the application of this wisdom that will have an impact on our lives so that we can live skillfully when it comes to these things. Because one of the things, this is one of the truths, that whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but whoever is the companion of fools will suffer harm. If you, if you hang out with foolish people, it's going to end up hurting you. And he says, why don't you walk with wise people? Well, how would I know? Here's some examples of, of practical ways wisdom makes a difference and ways that we can observe and understand what a, what a foolish person is in contrast to a wise person. Now, we're going to take communion in just a second. And the, and the worship team is back in the back. I heard him back there. So um, we're going to come out in just a minute and lead us in communion. But I want to close with this because... It's very important that we, you know, we're a small group this morning, so we can make this easy and personal. 
it's important that we understand that, that even though I'm using the analogy, the illustration of being an app, like app you know, applying to our lives, it's not an impersonal thing at all. And I, I mentioned that earlier, but I'm going to come back to it. That it really comes down to a personal relationship with God. Because when it comes to the wisdom, is the wisdom of God. It's not a worldly wisdom. It's not just like we go, oh, we, we, we've asked all the people in the world was the smartest way to live, and so we came up with that. And it's like, no, it, it tells us in Corinthians chapter 1 that through wisdom, the world did not come to know God. In other words, it's not like you've got to go to a university to figure out who God is. It, it, he made himself available to us through his son. He made himself completely accessible for the purpose of expressing his love to us, showing us our need, paying for our sins, and then opening the door to us that whoever would receive Jesus Christ can be saved, can be born again, can be forgiven. But it requires an action that leads to a personal relationship. And that's described as the role of Jesus Christ being the wisdom of God for us. Saying, God's so wise, he made this so simple that it's available to every one of us. And we don't have to be intellectual giants to figure this out. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God to save sinners, to give us a right to have access to heaven, to become children of God by his power. And that's God's wisdom, his wisdom, his plan for us. His provision for us to save those who, of us or us we, who had no hope of salvation. But God in his wisdom provided a way. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. It's so much better than any plan we would ever come up with. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. But of him, by his love, by his power, by his salvation, we are in Christ Jesus who came, became for us Wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All because of his great love and his willingness to go to the cross, lay down his life for you and I. That's the power of God and the wisdom of God extended to us. And because we come to know him, then we can also experience his wisdom on a day-to-day -day basis. Say, God, would you just lead me? Would you just teach me? Would you show me by your word and by your spirit, Lord, show me how to walk wisely? And we have that incredible privilege due to his grace and goodness. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for loving us and for coming to, the, to humble yourself and lay down your life for us. To, I, I, we, we can't even really comprehend what it would be like to step out of heaven into this earth to endure all the things that you went through, Lord, to experience life and evil and temptation and, uh, and then to become obedient even to the death of the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you triumphed over the grave, that your death is enough for each and every one of us, Lord. It's truly your incredible wisdom and plan, Lord, that we could not even imagine and yet you did it for us, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord, and we pray that our hearts would just be filled with uh, love and amazement. And Lord, with a, a refreshed determination to draw near to you, to, to seek you for wisdom every day, Lord. Saying we just want to please you, Lord. We just want to walk with you and see your wisdom applied in our lives. Give us skill for living, Lord, so that we would live in a righteous, holy way. Showing our love, your love to a world around us, your light to the world around us. Uh, Lord, thank you. Uh, we ask these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus.